And yeah, so it is, uh, it's Monday, uh, week three, and the topic of the day is random number generation, okay? Um, and so what we saw, so I'll admit, I'm kind of, like, if you look at a traditional Monte Carlo textbook, it would not go in the order that I presented material, okay? So I kind of started off saying, starting with like Bayesian concepts and, uh, and I presented kind of these Bayesian ideas. And I said, you know, because everything's a random variable, when you want to compute an expectation, it's going to become the integral of basically the, uh, the expectation of a function times the distribution of that random variable. And then, uh, and then last week we looked at Monte Carlo estimation for how do we estimate that expectation? And, and, you know, estimating that expectation has been, uh, has depended on our ability to draw random values from whatever distribution we're talking about. So we've got some distribution F and we want to draw random values from it. And, and that's how, um, when we do that, we get, you know, values X come from some distribution F. We plug those values X into H and basically we take the sample mean of H applied to all of those random values drawn from X. And that's how we estimate the, this expectation. So this expectation, the expectation of the function H applied to the random variable X where X comes from this distribution F is basically the sample mean of H applied to a bunch of random values of X. All right. And, um, and everything so far depended on being able to draw random values from this distribution, okay? And everything we've done so far has depended on R's ability to generate values from known distributions. So we've been using R's ability to generate, say the R values from R beta, okay? Or um, generate values from the normal distribution using R norm, or we've depended on R's ability to generate you know, whatever distribution it is, the gamma distribution, the uh, Poisson or something, you know, you, you had to do it in your homework. Um, and uh, we would use R whatever to, uh, to generate those values, okay? And so what we're gonna look at today is how do we generate values from these distributions to begin with, okay? So, so that's what we're gonna look at today, okay? And I like to kind of do things a little bit out of order because if we start off with this question, how do we generate values to begin with? I don't know. I always felt like it feels a tiny bit pointless. At least now we know there's a reason for it, I think. Maybe, maybe not. But OK, anyway, so we're, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at generating values um, from some distribution. OK, and so, um, you know, kind of the, the first thing that we have to think about and talk about is just being able to generate random numbers in the first place, okay? And, uh, and pretty much everything in the future is gonna rely on us being able to generate values from a random uniform distribution. And so um, generating random uniform values or just even random numbers in general was a really challenging task, okay? Um, in that, well, people didn't have access to computers like we do now. And so if you were a researcher in like the 1940s or something, 1950s, something like that, you didn't have your own personal computer, but you wanted to do something um, that required uh, the generation of random data or things like that, you would have to, um, you would buy a book of random digit tables, okay? These random digit tables would be generated by some corporation like RAND, okay? Um, uh, because they had access to kind of the machinery to generate random numbers. And then you would go and you would, you would buy it. And, and so they, I think RAND kind of republished uh, a book of a million random digits, I, I think just for fun, but, um, but you can like buy it and, um, and this is this is basically what the uh, the book looks like. Okay, it's just uh, you know line zero, and these are the digits one zero zero nine seven three two five three three so on and so forth. 
and you would have 600 pages of this stuff, okay? This is just page after page after page of just, <laughs> I love this. Uh, wait, where did it go? Page seven is not included in the book preview as, <laughs> as if that's a, like a critical thing. But, but anyway, this is just a, um, you just get pages of random digits and this is what you would use because you didn't have a computer that where you can just say our unif, okay? And so you would uh, you would consult this and, and you would buy buy something like that, okay? Um, but well, actually, if you read read up on this, the um, so before um, before you get to the tables of digits, they um, the kind of the introduction talks about the system that they used to generate these numbers to begin with, okay? And so there's there's a lot of details on um, how they generated these numbers. And basically they used this uh, electronic, they, these electrical pulses and stuff to generate those numbers. Um, and, um, and this is totally a side thing that has nothing to do with anything with the rest of the course. But sometimes I just like to wonder is anything truly random? And um, I don't know the answer to this question, okay? <laughs> so if, if you think about this, this question, like is anything in life truly random, right? Uh, so we often treat like a coin flip or rolling a die as like a, a random event, but is it truly random in that, um, like if you knew how much force you applied to the coin when you flipped it, or if you knew exactly how much force was being applied to the dice um, when you flipped it or rolled it, and you knew kind of the properties of, you know, how the uh, the coin um, lands and bounces and stuff like that, like could you predict how it will land? And uh, and I think if you knew all of the variables in play, I think the answer is yes, you would be able to kind of predict how it lands. So you know that's kind of the question: is it is it even random? Um, and then if you think about what, you know, your thoughts in your brain and stuff, it's just um, the result of like electrical impulses firing from neurons and stuff. And those, your neurons are just reacting to stimuli. And, um, you know, and then, and then there's a whole question of, you know, do people even have free will and stuff? And, and you know, there's kind of, are things deterministic and, you know, depending, you know, if, you know, if you're religious, you know, you, you know, you might be believe in, you know, a, a supreme being that's kind of sovereign over everything um, and everything's predetermined, you know, it's, there's a lot of stuff to, uh, to, to wonder about, okay? Um, quantum mechanics kind of states that there is true randomness at the quantum level, okay? And Einstein famously kind of argued against it and said that it only appears random. It's just that people don't understand what's happening on the inside and we're not able to observe what's happening on the inside, but you know, it can't truly be random. But I, you know, if you talk to somebody who studies quantum mechanics, they would argue that Einstein is wrong. Um, but anyway, something to think about. You can go down a big rabbit hole of this stuff by searching free will on Wikipedia and reading all of the linked articles. <laughs> Um, but anyway, back to our discussion, let's talk about um, generating random numbers on the, uh, on the computer here. Okay, um, so we have, on, on the computer we use a pseudo random number generator. Okay, pseudo because it's not really random, it's, it's fake random, okay? So, so pseudo random number generators are deterministic, okay? Meaning that they're not random and they're just kind of following instructions, but when they produce values, the values that they produce look like random numbers and they behave like random numbers, okay? And, and for, you know, pretty much most intents and purposes, we can treat them like random numbers, but they're not really random because if you give give it the same starting seed, it's gonna produce the same sequence of values. Okay, so that's why, you know, if I say set seed one and you say set seed one, our computers are gonna produce the same set of numbers because 
it's following the pseudo random number generator and and they look like random numbers but they're they're really not they're they're deterministic and and that's important for re reproducibility okay and the topic of pseudo random number generators was was really important for several several decades cuz people wanted to be able to generate numbers that looked like random numbers. Um, and so a lot of attention was, um, was spent on it, okay? Um, eventually, the, they came up with an algorithm that performed very well, passed a bunch of tests, and, and now people aren't really studying this anymore because it's kind of treated like a solved problem. But I wanted to talk about kind of one of the classical methods for generating random numbers was the linear congruential generator. And you can read, look this up uh, and read more about it. Um, but it's a simple um, and a well-known method. And basically uh, the way it works is you start with some number, okay, Xn, and the very first number is your starting seed, okay? Um, but basically you start some number and then, uh, and you multiply it by A, you add a constant C and then you do modulo m, okay? Um, so you know, basically divide by m and take the remainder, and um, and whatever number you get will be your next number that you use, okay? You'll get um, the next value, and then you kind of repeat, and you'll you'll plug that number in here, multiply by a, add a constant, mod m, and it's going to spit out in the next number, okay? So here's an example of how it would work if your seed is one. A is two, C is zero, and M is nine, okay? So I'm gonna plug in one into here, and I'm gonna multiply it by two, two times basically X plus C, which is zero, and then mod M. So I do two times one is zero, uh, two times one plus zero, it becomes um, two mod nine, and I get two. And then I multiply that by two, and I'm gonna get add zero, and I get four mod nine, which is four. And then I get eight mod nine, which is eight. And when I multiply eight times two, I get 16. Okay, eight times two is uh, 16 plus zero is, so I get 16 mod nine. Now 16 mod nine is equal to seven, right? Because uh, if you do 16 divided by nine, you're gonna get one remainder seven, so we get seven. And then I do you know two times seven plus zero, and I'm gonna get 14 mod nine, okay? 14 mod nine is equal to five. And then I get the next one, two times five is 10 mod nine. So 10 mod nine is one. And then when I plug that back in, one times two is two and I get two mod nine and I get two again, okay? And so this is gonna, so the cycle is gonna repeat, okay? So it goes two, four, eight, seven, five, one. And then it brings me back to two and then it's gonna repeat again. It's gonna go two, four, eight, seven, five, one. Okay, so this is this is a very very bad set of values to use for a pseudo random number generator because it's going to just keep cycling the digits two four eight seven five one two four eight seven five one and that's going to be very undesirable. We don't want that. Okay, um, but I'll I'll go ahead and I'll program it, and it's very simple. This is basically the uh, the entire algorithm a times x plus c mod m. And this is just a, a few extra things, right? So I'm going to create a function called rand, and it's going to ask for how many values do you want to generate? Give me the seed and then the, the values a, c, and m. And then it's going to kind of create an empty output vector of length n. And it's going to start off, set the seed to x, and then it's going to just kind of loop n times uh, each time generating the next x value. It's going to update the x value. Um, as such, and it's going to store the x value into output. So if I start, basically, if I ask for 12 numbers, starting with the same values that I had back on this slide, okay, then it generates the, that sequence, 248751, and then it repeats 248751. Okay, so we have a question. Um, is there a way to know what set of values are good for random generation? So, so this was a topic that was studied, and, um, and you can look up you can look up this topic, the linear congruential generator, and there's kind of a table of like known values that have fairly good performance, okay? And so um, uh, this, uh, these values are known to have fairly good performance, okay? 
So this um, uh, ANSI C is a uh, standard of the C language. Okay. So um, so uh, <laughs> so if you took like uh, PIC ten. PIC 10A or um, CS31, you would have learned C++, which is like a derivative of the C language. Uh, so the C language, so, you know, interesting, I don't know if this is interesting, but a little bit of history. Um, C language was developed by Bell Labs, uh, which also developed um, the predecessor to R, the language S, okay? So, you know, today I think, you know, the desirable companies to work for, for like, machine learning and, you know, cutting edge research are places like Google and Facebook, um, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Microsoft, places like that. Those, those places have kind of research divisions that are developing like cutting edge software and machine learning uh, topics and algorithms. But, you know, if you go back a couple generations, um, Bell Labs was the place that developed all sorts of cool um, research. And, um, and so, you know, Bell Labs was the research division of the um, the, the telecom giant. Okay, basically uh, the the parent company of um, AT and T or predecessor of AT and T that basically controlled all of the phone lines, and they did a whole bunch of research. You know, they basically found that um, like phone call usage was you know followed a Poisson distribution and stuff because they needed to know like how many calls can you expect in a certain given number of times. So anyway, Bell Labs developed all kinds of uh, really cool stuff, uh, including uh, the language C and the language S, which later S becomes R, and then C, you know, is you know gave way to C plus uh, plus. So anyway, um, so ANSI C was uh, kind of a standard of the C language, you know, you know, a few generations back, and. Uh, and if you ask for random numbers from ANSI C, it would have used a linear congruential number generator with these values. Whatever the number this is for your A, your, uh, the constant that you would add would be one, two, three, four, five. And then the modulo value you'd use is two to the 31. So here I can just ask for a hundred random values where I plug in uh, that seed and you know those constants. And this is kind of the, uh, the sequence of numbers that I get. And, um, and so here I say, well, give me um, 10,000 of these values and I'm going to plug in those constants as well. And then to kind of make it um, a random uniform, I'm going to take uh, these values of X and I'm going to div divide it by two to the 31. Okay, because I'm doing mod two to the 31. So I'm going to divide by two to the 31. So this will scale it between zero and one. And if I create a histogram, you know, we see something that looks a lot like um, uh, a fairly uniform distribution, okay? And then um, here's a plot of the empirical CDF function, okay? Or empirical CDF in that, um, you know, red is the theoretic for a uniform uh, distribution from zero to one, and the black line is the empirical. And we, we can see we get pretty close match between the empirical in black and the theoretic in red, okay? And so that's um, that's a linear congruential generator. Now, today, we don't use the linear congruential generator anymore, okay? So the LCG, this, this is like a simple algorithm. I think it's easy to understand. We can see how it kind of generates values. Um, and, uh, oh, and so, you know, one thing is that because it's got mod, Two to the thirty-one, it's kind of max period length is it's it will eventually cycle. Okay, the values will eventually cycle, but I think after two to the thirty-one values. Okay, but we don't um, we don't use the LCG anymore. Um, pretty much, almost uh, not all, but um, a lot. I think most most computer languages, if they have a random number function will use the uh, Mersenne twister, okay? Uh, this is kind of the, the most popular choice uh, for uh, random number generation. It's the default algorithm in R. It's also the default in Python, MATLAB, uh, a lot of versions of C++ uh, and a whole bunch of other languages, okay? This one has kind of 
one, the pseudo random number generator thing and, uh, and it's kind of taken over, right? It was developed in 1997 and, uh, and it uses a Mersenne prime, okay? To, uh, and that's where it gets its name. The algorithm itself is, uh, is very complicated, okay? Uh, it's beyond the scope of the course. We're not gonna learn the details of the Mersenne twister. Um, and, uh, and basically after, after it was developed, you know, it, it was run through its paces. They, they ran a whole bunch of statistical tests on the numbers that it generated. And pretty much uh, in, uh, in almost all, it didn't, not every single one, but, but almost all of the tests, it kind of passed in that, like you couldn't tell the difference between the values produced by the Mersenne twister and truly random numbers, okay? So it passed a whole bunch of tests. And so that's why it became so popular in that it's, it operates fast, it creates random numbers, uh, and, and it's pretty much, it's more than adequate for, for almost everyone's you know, needs, okay? The uh, one limitation of the Mersenne twister is that it is not cryptographically secure. So if you need to do encryption stuff, like if you're a bank and you wanna keep people's identity and stuff safe, don't use the Mersenne twister because it has been shown that if you look at the values generated by the algorithm, if you, if you see enough values, it's possible to kind of reverse engineer or figure out what seed was used to generate these values. And if you know what seed was used to generate the values, then you can predict the, the next few, you know, the, the future values that it's gonna produce. So in that regard, you know, the Mersenne twister, you know, doesn't work, but for pretty much all other needs, it's, uh, it's good enough, okay? Um, so, you know, companies that do need um, cryptographically secure numbers um, will have, will use different algorithms. And, um, and then there are like physical ways to get true random numbers kind of based on physical properties of the universe. Well, they'll, they'll do um, like, uh, like, um, I don't know, they'll, they'll take like the temperature of some, some item that, that maybe is, is subject to random fluctuations or they'll like uh, shoot like a laser and basically based on like beam splitting, which will have, you know, it's like the, whatever, the dual particle and wave nature of electrons and stuff, you know, they, they can have like truly random things going on, but this, this is good enough for us, okay? So anyway, that's the Mersenne twister. And basically after the Mersenne twister came along, we've treated the uh, topic of pseudo random number generator as like, as a solved topic. So we don't, I don't think much research is being done in, on, that, on that topic. Um, have I given you any um, quiz answers yet? None, okay, let me give you, uh, I guess I'll give you your first two, okay? First two answers will be um, E and C, elephant and cat. Those are your first two quiz answers. Elephant and cat, E and C, okay? Will be your first two quiz, quiz answers. I'll give you your, um, the last one uh, later, okay? So, uh, all right, so the, um, the rest of today's lecture will uh, be on inverse CDF method. And, and we'll also look at more ways of generating um, random variables uh, or values from different uh, distributions. But they all depend on our ability to generate values from the, uh, the random uniform distribution, okay? Uh, random values from the uniform distribution. And so, um, you know, we looked at the linear congruential generator, which again is no longer used, and um, and we use the Mersenne twister. Um, but the Mersenne twister will generate values that um, that come from the uniform distribution. Okay, and so the uniform distribution has this PDF. Okay, it's one for uh, values between zero and one, and it's zero everywhere else. And um, and when we use call R unif uh, in R, it's going to generate. Um, random uniform values, okay? So random R uh, unif for uh, uniform, okay? And 
again, when you call R unif in R, it's, it's coming from the Mersenne twister. All right, so um, the, the first method that we look at is the inverse CDF or inverse transform method, okay? And it, what it does is, is it takes the CDF, the cumulative distribution function of a random variable or of a probability distribution um, to, to generate values, okay? And so the definition of a CDF is this. It's that, um, so the CDF we denote by calling it big F of X, okay, versus the PDF, which is usually little f, okay? So the PDF will be like little f of X and the CDF is big F of X and big F of X is defined as the probability that X, that the random variable X is less than some value little x, okay? So it's the probability that the random variable x is less than some value little x. And what is that probability? That's gonna be the integral from negative infinity to little x of f of t dt. Okay, so that's kind of the definition of the CDF. And if you think about it, the CDF will map values of the random variable x, okay? The, from the support of x, so, you know, if it's normal, it goes from negative infinity to positive infinity, or if it's exponential, it goes from zero to infinity or beta goes from zero to one or whatever, you know, it takes whatever support of X you have and it maps it to the interval zero to one because the probability, this probability has to be between zero and one. So whatever values X can take on, it's going to um, get mapped to this from, to the interval zero to one. And, and there's a kind of uh, an important theorem that states the probability integral transform, okay, states that um, if X is a random variable um, and X has um, this CDF F, okay, it's got the cumulative distribution function is big F, then if you define U as the result of plugging X into big F, U has a standard uniform distribution. I asked my last class if they had heard this before and they, they all pretty much said no, okay? So, um, so basically, if you have a random variable that comes, random variable X, and you plug X into the CDF, the result will be uniform, uniformly distributed, okay? So, so basically, um, and I kind of wanted to demonstrate this. And uh, so here, let me, let me delete this, okay? So this is what I did. So last class I said, you know, let me generate a whole bunch of values from the random normal distribution, okay? Okay, so we're gonna generate a whole bunch of values from the random normal distribution. And if I create a histogram of that, this is what your histogram looks like. This is a histogram of a bunch of random normal values. And I'm gonna plug all of these in, okay? I, I plug all of these values, I've got 100,000 of them. I plug them into the CDF. The CDF of the normal distribution is P norm, okay? If I plug in those values of Z into P norm, what is the distribution? Uh, what is the distribution of that, okay? So I'm gonna call um, uh, P norm of Z, I'm gonna save those into Y. And what's the histogram of Y? The histogram of Y is gonna be uniform. Uh, and you can take any distribution. So here I'm gonna, um, I can generate a whole bunch of values from a gamma distribution with shape parameter three and rate equal to 0 0.5, okay? And so if I say, well, what's the histogram of these gamma distribution values? This is the histogram of the gamma distribution values. It, um, you know, it has this shape, okay? And if I plug, those values into the CDF of the gamma distribution with shape parameter three and rate parameter 0.5, okay? If I plug uh, these values that I just generated into the CDF and I say, well, what's the distribution of the um, resulting values after plugging them into the CDF, they become uniformly distributed, okay? And, uh, and any value variable that you can think of, okay? If you generate values X from some distribution F, okay, and then you plug X into the CDF, the resulting value is gonna be between zero and one, and not just, it's gonna be 
a value between zero and one because of the CDF, it's gonna be uniformly distributed, okay? And that's the uh, probability integral transform, okay? And so what the inverse CDF method does is it takes that and it kind of um, flips it around. So it says, you know, this function f transforms the random variable x into a uniform zero one distribution, okay? So if we start off with uniform zero one, we can plug it into the inverse of f and we can plug that into the inverse of f and get back x. Right, so x, the f transforms x into uniform zero one. And so if I take the inverse of f, okay, I can plug in zero, uniform zero one to get back x. Okay, and that's, gonna, that's the basis of the, um, the inverse CDF method. You can read more about this theorem, the probability integral transform uh, right here, um, but, but we're gonna do the uh, inverse CDF, okay? So the, uh, um, if x is a kind of a continuous variable, um, and it's got this CDF um, function, cumulative distribution function, then the inverse transform, inverse CDF transform is going to be defined as this, okay? So you basically take the inverse of F, okay? And the inverse of F basically is where, uh, you know, I have to write it out this way, but in most cases, it's going to be basically the value of U uh, or... Uh, you know, the value where um, f of t is equal to u, okay? But, but I have to write it as this way, min of t such that the f of t, okay? Min of t this, it means the smallest value of t that satisfies this criteria, that f of t is greater than or equal to u because it's possible for your CDF function to have a flat region, okay? And, if, um, and so whenever you have a uh, inverse function, what it does is it, it flips it around on the, um, the line y equals x, right? So if you have something like this, it, it, it um, reflects it across the line y equals x. And, um, and so if you have a, a region that's flat, when you reflect it across the line y equals x, it becomes a vertical line, right? And so, um, uh, and in functions, you're not allowed to have vertical lines because in a function, every value of x needs to be mapped to a unique value in y, so it cannot be mapped to a vertical line. So if, if something gets mapped to a vertical line, then, um, then that's going to be a problem. And so we say, to kind of solve that, we're just going to say, take the smallest value in that vertical segment. I don't know if that makes sense here. It, it'll make sense when we do discrete distributions, which will be on Wednesday, okay? But, uh, but anyway, so we write it uh, basically as this. And so basically we have the inverse function of f. Um, and if you stick in a uniform value, a uniform random value into the inverse function of f, you're gonna get values that come from x where x is, you know, has this CDF function. Uh, so here's like a little proof of how that works. And basically, we're going to look at just this quantity. What happens if you plug in a random uniform value into the inverse function of f? Okay. So that if I plug in a random uniform value into the inverse function of f, you know, I, I, I could probably make this a little bit more clear. Basically, I'm going to have the random uniform value in the inverse function of f, and I'm going to take f of both f of this. Okay. And so f of f inverse of u. Is just going to become u, right? I think I, I I'm going to edit this slide. Okay, so I've got if I do f of f inverse of u, I'm going to just be left with u. Okay, and on the other hand, if I take f of x, I'm going to get f of x. Okay, so I'm going to take um, plug both sides of this inequality into the function f, uh, into the function big F. So f of f inverse of u becomes u, and f of x is f of x. Okay, and what's the probability that u is less than or equal to f of x? The probability that u is less than or equal to just any number p is just p, okay? When u is uniform, probability of u less than p is just equal to p. And so this just reduces to f of x, big F of x, and therefore f inverse of u has the same distribution as x. All right, so this is, this is how it works when you, um, 
when you plug in your numbers, okay? We're gonna just, if we wanna generate samples of the random variable X, which has this distribution, CDF, okay? We're going to, um, first we have to derive the inverse CDF, that's F inverse of U, okay? And then we're gonna generate random values from the uniform distribution. And then we just plug those numbers in, okay? And we're gonna get X, okay? And this, this is gonna work as long as we can find the inverse CDF. Now, sometimes this task, um, this test, this is a big if, okay? Sometimes finding the inverse CDF is, is very hard to do, okay? And, um, um, uh, but it, if you can do it, it'll work for both continuous and discrete distributions. All right, so here's a, we'll, we'll look at a few examples and, um, and that will be it. Um, Okay, so um, so let's say you have a random uniform variable, not on not standard norm uh, standard uniform zero one, but this time the interval goes from a to b. Okay, so the PDF is one over b minus a for x between a and b. Okay, and then it's zero everywhere else. So if you say, well, what's the uh, CDF? What's the cumulative distribution function of that? You're gonna take the integral of one over B minus A, okay? And you're gonna start at A, go up to X, okay? So you're, it's the integral from A to X of one over B minus A DT, all right? And so then you're gonna get X over B minus A minus A over B minus A, okay? And so we get X minus A over B minus A. So that becomes, that's the CDF of of the uh, uniform distribution here. So then the uh, the inverse CDF is you take that, you take that CDF function and you set it equal to U, okay? So big F of X, you set that equal to U. So we have X minus A over B minus A. This is the CDF, we set that equal to U and then we're gonna solve for X, okay? So set F of X equal to U and solve for X. So I multiply both sides by B minus A. I got X minus A is equal to B minus A times U. I add A to both sides and I get X is equal to B minus A times U plus A. So my inverse CDF is this, B minus A times U plus A. So that's my inverse CDF function. All right, and so let's say we wanna generate um, values from the random uniform values on the interval 10 to 20, okay? So in that case, my inverse CDF function is gonna be 20 minus 10 times u plus 10, which simplifies to 10 u plus 10. All right, and so, you know, if, if your random value, your random uniform value, so if our uniform produces u equal to zero, then the corresponding x value is gonna be 10. And if the random uniform produces uh, u equal to one, then the corresponding x value is gonna be 20, right? And then I think, if we can see that, then it becomes clear that everything kind of becomes uniformly, um, um, distributed on that interval. So if U equals say 0.22, then you'd plug that in and you'd get 12.2. If U equals 0.5, then X is going to fit be 15. And so whatever ran, um, random value of U that you get between zero and one, you're going to get kind of a corresponding X value between, between between 10 and 20, all right? So that's kind of the inverse CDF of the uniform distribution. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's take a look at another example. Here I've got uh, the exponential distribution, okay? So if you look at the exponential distribution, the PDF of an exponential uh, variable with rate parameter lambda is lambda e to the negative lambda x, okay? That's the PDF of a exponential um, variable. And so the uh, the CDF of this is the integral, okay? Uh, exponential is, exists only for X positive. So we're gonna go from zero to X of lambda E to the negative lambda T DT. All right, and so when you uh, solve for the CDF, you're gonna get one minus E to the negative lambda X. All right, so that's what you get when you do um, the uh, cumulative distribution function, all right? All right, and so the inverse CDF 
is uh, is simple enough. Okay, you set again. You set f of x equal to u, and you solve for x. So big F of x is one minus e to the negative lambda x. We set that equal to u. Um, I subtract one from both sides and get negative e to the negative lambda x is equal to u minus one. Multiply both sides by negative one. And then I take the log of both sides. So I get negative lambda x equals log of one minus u. And then I divide both sides by negative lambda and I get x equals negative one over lambda log of one minus u. All right, so this, this will work as the inverse, um, inverse function of u, okay? Now, this section, one minus u, if you think about uh, a random variable u and the random variable one minus u, okay? The, the quantity one minus u, u and one minus u both have a uniform distribution, right? Like if u is uniformly distributed from zero to one, then the quantity one minus u is also uniformly distributed from zero to one, okay? Just kind of, they're going in opposite directions, but it, it is not really going in direction. It's just um, the variable itself. So one minus u has the same distribution as u. So sometimes you'll often see uh, the uh, inverse function, um, they'll replace one minus u with just u, okay? So I got negative one over lambda log u, negative one over lambda log u. Okay, and so let's say I want to generate values from exponential distribution with rate parameter one, that will just become negative log u, okay, negative log u. And so, um, so if I ask R unif and R unif pro produces the number zero, okay, which it's u will equal zero with probability zero. So R unif will never actually produce zero, but if it did, then the corresponding x would be infinity. And if our unit pro produces a value exactly one, again, this happens with probability zero of exactly one, then the corresponding X is gonna be zero, okay? Uh, and if U produces kind of any of these other values, if U is 0.1, then the corresponding value will be 2.3. If U is 0.5, then the corresponding value is 0.693. And if U is 0.9, then the corresponding value is gonna be 0.105, okay? Um, but it's gonna kind of generate uh, values like this. So let me just show you um, kind of a bunch of values that I've generated here. So here's the code I used. Notice I'm not generating values using R exponential. I'm saying, give me random uniform values, right? Give me random uniform values. I want 10,000 of them, 10 to the four random uniform values. I get U. And then the inverse CDF, I apply inverse transform method and I'm gonna take negative of the log of u, right? So that, cause that's my, that's what I'm doing. The inverse CDF with lambda equal to one is negative log of u. So I take the uniform values and I plug them in to the uh, inverse CDF function. And those are gonna be my X values. And if I produce the histogram of my X values, I get this histogram and I overlay the theoretic density curve of an exponential distribution. Okay, so if I add the theoretic density curve on top of my histogram, we see that there's pretty good alignment between the uniform distribution, I mean, be, between the um, values I generated from inverse transform and the theoretic um, density to kind of, Further investigate, I can create the empirical CDF. So here's the empirical CDF of the values that I observed, right? Um, and I'm plotting that against the theoretic CDF function. So the theoretic CDF function is based on P exponential, and that's in red. And then the empirical CDF, which we talked about, which is based just on the sample of values that we've observed, uh, is overlaid in black. Okay, and so we see a good match between the empirical CDF and the, um, the theoretic CDF in red. Okay, and so that's a good sign um, indicating that it looks like our empirical values match the, uh, the theoretic values. And then here's another uh, thing that we can run. And this is the uh, Kolmogorov Smirnoff test, also known as just the KS test. Okay, so these are. Um, I'm pretty sure Russian um, statisticians, okay? 
And it's a statistical test that we can use to see if um, a sample that we've observed comes from a particular distribution, right? So in this case, um, I've got my sample of values X. Again, X was generated not by sampling R exponential, but I took R uniform values, random uniform values, and I plugged them into the inverse CDL, okay? So, um, so I take my sample values X and I compare it against the, the theoretic CDF, okay? This theoretic CDF is the P exponential function, okay? And if you have additional parameters that need to get passed to the, um, to kind of specify the, uh, that CDF, um, you, you kind of, you pass them on um, over here, okay? So I've got P exponential comma rate equal to one. And then when I run that test, the one sample KS test or um, produces a p-value of 0 0.3886, okay? You can also use the KS test to see if two different samples could have come from the same distribution. So there's a, so you also have the two sample KS test. You can read more about the, um, the KS test. But, um, but here I just tested um, my one sample against this theoretic CDF, the p-exponential and it produced a, a p-value of 0 0.3886, okay? So this p-value is bigger than 0 0.05, which means that we will not reject the null hypothesis, okay? And what that means is that I do not have evidence to say that these values did not come from, a, uh, from an exponential distribution with rate equal one, okay? Now, in statistics, we have to be careful, right? We have to even, I, I can say I don't have evidence against the null, but we're not allowed to say that this proves that the null is true, right? So the language as, as statisticians, um, we have to kind of be careful about that, right? Is that all right as far as um, looking at this? Okay. Um, and all right, so the, uh, the last thing that I'll show you is that uh, we can do the normal distribution. And, and then I think we're gonna run out of time here. Um, so I'll do the, uh, the next part on Wednesday. Um, so the normal distribution um, in R, and when you ask R for random values from the normal distribution, it uses inverse CDF method as well, okay? And so the true CDF and true inverse CDF functions um, don't have closed form solutions. But R uses these functions P norm and Q norm that are very good approximations. They're ac the, these are approximations that are accurate up to 16 digits, okay? So that's, that's probably good enough for uh, most of our purposes. And, and R basically uses that, uses the Q norm, which is the inverse of P norm, uh, it uses Q norm to generate random values uh, from the normal distribution, okay? So just to kind of show you, here I asked R to, I set my seed to one, and I asked R to generate five values from the random uniform, okay? And, and, um, and I had to ask for it to print out a few more digits than normal, okay? So these are five values from the random uniform. And so this first number that it generate was 0 0.26550866, so on and so forth, okay? Now I'm gonna take this number and I'm gonna plug that into the inverse C CDF of the normal function. I'm gonna plug that number into Q norm. And what does it output? It outputs this, negative 0.6264, okay? Um, I take the, uh, not the next value, but the, uh, I skip every other value, okay? And so I take this value, 0.57285, and I plug that into Q norm, 0.57285, and I get the value 0 0.1836, okay? And then I skip a value and I take this number, 0.20168, and I get negative 0.8356, right? Now notice what happens when I ask for our norm, okay? So if I go back and I set seed back to one, and I ask for three values from the random normal distribution or from the normal distribution, three random values. Notice that this value, that these values are the values that I get by plugging in our uniform values 
into Q norm, okay? So this value point uh, 1836, point 1836, negative point 8356, negative point 8356, okay? So the values generated by R norm are the same as the values generated by R unif plugged into the inverse CDF of the normal func normal distribution function, okay? So I think that's kind of neat that this is how R is generating um, values from the uh, from the normal distribution. Okay, it's just using inverse CDF method. It, it's generating random uniform values. Random uniform comes from the Mersenne twister, but it takes the random uniform values and then it takes basically every other one and it plugs it into Q norm to give us um, random normal values here. All right, let me give you your last quiz answer. Last quiz answer is the letter A, A as an apple. A as an apple for the last quiz answer. All right, do we have any questions on this? Is this all good? So far so good? Yeah, I don't know what happened in the second and fourth number, okay? It just, when you use Q norm, it just kind of takes the odd position values. All right, so I don't know what happened to the second and fourth numbers, but, but that's what it does, okay? Um, Okay, so yeah, last quiz answer is A, uh, and that'll be it for today. We'll, um, I'll cover the next example. We'll do more examples of inverse CDF, so we'll see you guys on Wednesday. Okay, have a good day.